Okay, so welcome to our blockchain, NFT and smart contracts. Deep dive, I assume that's the most buzzwordy session at DevOx. We tried to add bitcoins and, and crypto too, but it didn't fit on the slide. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we are here today to um, talk about Z technologies, how they can be used, especially how they can be used with Java. Who are we? Um, maybe you want to start, Michael? Yeah, so my name is Michael. Um, I'm a Java champion. I'm the leader of the Java user group Freiburg in Germany, so obviously I am from Germany. Um, I work as a contractor for Swartz Labs, and Swartz Labs is working on the Hedera uh, um, public ledger. Um, also, I'm the founder of the Netopia uh, GmbH. I love coding. Um, I love to spend time with my family. I like to cook a lot um, if I have time, and I like to travel. And I'm Hendrik. I live in Germany too. I'm a Java champion too. And next to Michael, I work for Swartz Labs as a contractor to, to work on yeah, a public ledger that is currently called Hedera. Um, I'm the founder of the Open Elements company too. And um, yeah, I work um, heavily in an open source, especially the ya last years in the Eclipse Foundation as a member of the Eclipse Adoptium project where I was in the working group and in the PMC, in the project management committee. And yeah, next to, to Java and technology, I love Star Wars, Docs, I'm a board game nerd, and I'm really into open source. Okay, so um, what will we learn today? So what topics uh, have we prepared for you. So we would like, um, after we did some history, we would like to talk about blockchains. So what is a blockchain? How is the technology behind a blockchain or of a blockchain working? And where can you really use it in what kind of projects and what kind of sectors? Then we talk about tokens and, and NFTs. So what is a token? What is an NFT? I can give you already a hint. It's a special kind of token. And in what areas such token makes sense to be used. And we talk about smart contract, which is like a, a third big buzzword topic currently in the Web3 or, or crypto space that let you execute code on a kind of, of blockchain or on a public ledger. And we will have a look at that too. Um, yeah, and we will use this all by using public ledgers. So maybe you heard about things like Ethereum or Hedera. So, so public ledgers that are out there that can be um, used by using a public, um, mostly open source API. Um, but we will have a look at that later. Um, so what you will not learn today is how to get rich. <laughs> Right? So if anybody is here to, to get some good information about what cryptocurrency he should buy or, or um, how he can get rich by, by buying NFTs, I have, and Michael too, we have absolutely no idea, really zero idea about that topic. We try to really only have a look at it from, from a technical perspective. Um, since we have like a three hour session today, we will try to do some short breaks in between the topics. So we will start with some history and talking about blockchains. And let's see um, um, how long that takes, but currently we plan to do a break after that. And then another um, break after we've talked about smart, smart contracts and how to use them on a public ledger. Um, so before we start with the history, um, we prepared a kind of um, um, questionnaire for you. So if you, I think I need to do this. Oh no, no, it's the wrong monitor. Give me a second. So if you can just scan that one with your um, mobile phone, 
you will get like, like two questions regarding the session today. Um, so several people already did it. Uh, let me show it to you. So the first question is, do you own cryptocurrency? So who haven't done it, you can still go to menti.com and use this code to be part of the um, questionnaire. Oh, okay, so it's really like a lot of people here in the room own bitcoins or own some, some cryptography and more than 10% really looks like have a lot of them. That's interesting. I really expected to be those numbers a little bit lower. Okay. Um, I think there's no movement anymore in it. Oh no, there's still movement. So 175, 77 people have already voted. That's great. Let me do like, I don't know, a screenshot from it. So there's a second question um, regarding blockchain. If you've ever used a blockchain, like if you ever used it in a program, if, if you ever coded against a blockchain or created a blockchain, Yeah, that's great, because here mostly all never did it, and there are even more than 10% who have no real idea what a blockchain is. And that is great, because we will go into this as a next step. Cool. So thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, and let me now jump back to the slides. So as said, before we um, start talking about blockchain, I would like to do some crypto history. Right? So we do a, a history lesson regarding all the stuff that happened in the last years in cryptography. So um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is? Okay, uh, because I have no idea who is it. So the so people that, that write sense, do you really know who he is? Or have you heard the name? You heard the name, right? Okay. Because so this Satoshi Nakamoto um, invented Bitcoin. And, and what he did is um, he created a paper. I've just did a screenshot of the first page there. It can be found online at bitcom.org. And he created that paper in 2008. So it was an open paper that described the technology of Bitcoin and the goals of Bitcoin. So the whole idea was just published by this Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008. And based on this paper um, that um, became really popular in the crypto community, people started to, to use Bitcoin to contribute to the open source project Bitcoin and so on. Um, so next to the technology behind Bitcoin that we will see in a minute, um, it even defines the goals of Bitcoin. So from my point of view, there are like three main goals. So what Bitcoin should do is like it should define an, a currency that you can use every day, like, like a dollar or like a euro. Um, it should be a currency that has less, less exchange cost. So if you change this currency to, to something else, like another currency, like a dollar or something, the exchange cost should be very low. And it should remove the trust from banks. So currently when you have money, normally it's stored at a bank, and you trust the bank that the bank do not steal your money, that it do not use your money for something you don't want to. And this was the third idea of Bitcoin, to remove that trust against banks, because by defining a cryptographic proof, um, nobody can do anything with your money instead of you. And nobody can forbid you to do anything with your money instead of you. And um, so after this paper has been created, um, Satoshi Nakamoto started to implement the architecture of Bitcoin. And this happened in 2009. And the source code can be found at GitHub. So it's really just the GitHub Bitcoin organization and then the Bitcoin repository. There you can find the source code of Bitcoin. 
And as I asked at the beginning, so who's this Satoshi Nakamoto? So why is he not staying here and talking about Bitcoin? Because nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. This person, if it is a person, became inactive in 2010. So after 2010, nobody ever heard something about uh, Nakamoto. He never contributed to any project or did anything. Um, nobody knows who he is, which is quite funny because he invented something where a lot of people spent money in. And over the years, I, I didn't know this either. I watched a documentation about this. There were several people who claimed to be Nakamoto, but um, different like people from the press and so on um, found points why these people cannot be Nakamoto. So it's still unclear who really invented Bitcoin, if it's a single person, if it's a group of person, whatever. What we can say is that whoever Nakamoto is, is quite rich. Because he or the group or she owns about yeah, one million of Bitcoins. Um, so based on this and based on the current um, value of Bitcoins, he's definitely one of the, I don't know, like 100 richest people on the world. I, I've seen somewhere, I, I think we're, we're, um, at a point where, the, where there was the highest peak in, in the Bitcoin value, he was one of the 20 richest people in the world. And while he's rich, a lot of people really became poor maybe by Bitcoins because um, one problem with Bitcoins is since there is no bank, you can use your money, right? You have your keys on a hard drive on a USB stick, you use it, and then nobody can access your money anymore. You cannot access it and nobody else can access it. And until now, there are three millions of Bitcoins that already got lost by people deleting their hard drives, missing their uh, public and private keys and so on, which is an unbelievable high number of, I think it's 59 billion, of dollars that got lost just by this, right? And this is absolutely freaky. Um, another quite interesting fact, re uh, fact regarding Bitcoins is um, the Bitcoin Pizza Day. Maybe you've heard about that. It's in May, it's not the 4th of May, which is Star Wars Day, it's the 22nd of May. And, and the 22nd of May is since 12 years Bitcoin Pizza Day. So who've ever heard about Bitcoin Pizza Day? Some people, nice, okay. So why is it called Bitcoin Pizza Day? So it started in 2010, so like one year after Bitcoin has been implemented in the Bitcoin forum. And there was this guy, um, Ras Raslo, I, I think it's spelled Raslo, who said like, hey, so I would uh, pay 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. So is there anybody who would sell me two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins. Someone said like, oh, whoa, 10,000 Bitcoins, that's quite a bit. That is like about 41 US dollars. That should be fine for pizzas. As said, that was 20, uh, 2010, right? Thinking about today, those pizzas would cost 190 million US dollars because that's the value of the Bitcoins. I, I think I've checked this like, a week ago or something like that. And that was the value of Bitcoins at that day. So yeah, that is quite expensive for two pizzas. Um, so you should assume like everybody said like, hey, okay, I will, I will buy two pizzas for you for the Bitcoin. I mean, this was in the Bitcoin forum, right? So this was in the forum where all the people that believed in Bitcoins are. So two days later, after nothing happened, he said, like, hey, is my um, amount that I would give you maybe too low for two pizzas? Like $190 million. And he really waited some time. One day later, he said, you know, it would really be interesting if I could say that I could pay um, that I could buy pizza for Bitcoins. And then happily on the May 20, 
two, he received two pizzas from a person. And this was the first time that somebody bought something by using bitcoins. That's why the um, Bitcoin community celebrates this Bitcoin Pizza Day each year. And it's really funny to, to think about, like, this is today about oh, so over $100 million for these two pizzas. Yeah. Um, so another thing that came up in this time, because this is what you need to, to trade with Bitcoins, are those wallets, right? So wallets is something that you have to store your information or to store your private information that is needed to, to trade with any cryptocurrency. It started with Bitcoin. Today we have more different cryptocurrency, but in general, the wallets, the first wallets just use Bitcoin. Today we have a lot of wallets that support different types of cryptocurrency. And in general, we have four different types of wallets. So we have like wallets, one example is a Coinbase wallet that supports a lot of range of different cryptocurrencies. Then we have wallets like the one on the top right that is made especially for one cryptocurrency and based on this had a lot of more features for that specific cryptocurrency. Then on the bottom right, we have like a hardware wallet so it's like a kind of USB stick that stores all the information. The easiest wallet that you can have is like a sheet of paper. Because what a wallet really needs to do, it, it needs to store two things. It needs to store your public key and your private key. And you can think about that like the public key is like your bank account ID, right? Because this is public and everybody can see like how many crypto coins are connected to a public key. And then you have your private key and you need that private key to do transactions, to create transactions. And you can think about that like your online password, for, uh, like your password for online banking, right? Because without that, you can't do any transactions. But the difference against online banking is if you use those informations, there's no bank employee that can raise at your password, right? Then your money is lost. And that's a kind of problem. So I think that's enough for the Bitcoin history. So let's go back to the goals that I showed at the beginning. And let's ask ourselves, so when thinking about Bitcoin today, has Bitcoin achieved those goals? I personally would say like one of the goals has been achieved and two other not, because Bitcoin is definitely, and no other cryptocurrency is an everyday currency, right? So is there anybody in the room who already bought something today by using Bitcoin? Whoa, there's one. Okay, interesting. What have you bought? Pizza. <laughs> okay, that's nice, that, that's good. Um, the other thing is regarding the, um, again, common currency, because it's not common, and the exchange cost. Uh, so people are still need to buy exchange cost for transactions. So even if it's a little bit cheaper, this goal is not 100% achieved. What is achieved is that we have this cryptographic proof and that we do not need to use banks to yeah, pay with bitcoins or to trade bitcoins. Okay, so that's about bitcoins, which what we call like the first generation. Um, after bitcoins and after the hype of bitcoins, several parties want to get into this business and wanted to create their own. And there's one special project that really got a lot of attraction and is today really well known. That's why we call it like the second generation, which is Ethereum. Ethereum, um, again, started with a white paper in 2013, and then it was implemented, and two years later, the Ethereum network started. It's open source, like Bitcoin and so on, so it's quite similar to what we've seen for Bitcoin so far. The big difference is that um, what Ethereum provides is something that is called the Ethereum Virtual Machine, the EVM. So who's doing Java? 
Yeah. So you know about virtual machines. That's great. So you can think about the EVM really quite similar to the Java virtual machine. Later, like in the second part of our session, Michael will do a deep dive into the EVM so that we have a look maybe even what are the differences between the Java virtual machine and this one. But this one can be used to execute code directly on the network on Ethereum, so on the public ledger. And the code that is executed is called smart contracts. From my point of view, Michael and I discussed that it's kind of buzzword because smart contracts do not really say what a smart contract is or what kind of code is executed there. So let's just think about code that is executed within transactions in the Ethereum network. And Based on this, a lot of applications has been created in different sectors. One thing I want to show you is about gaming. So um, one thing that has been created based on this um, by the company Sky Mavis, which is a quite big player in, in this crypto area, is the game which is called Access Infinity. Um, this is a game I try to compare it with Pokemon like or Tamagotchi, because this is a game where you have like unique, they call it axes, so unique kind of animals with a unique face, with a unique, you know, color. So there's no two axes that are the same. And the definition of your axes, like what color they have, even what DNA they have, because you can like fight with this axis against other players. So you have like in the DNA values like the strange and so on. I'm not deep into that, but it's working kind of that. And all this is stored in the Ethereum network next to like cards you have to fight against other players. And there's even a marketplace where you can, for from my point of view, way too high values, um, buy those axes to, to use them and play against other players. And this is just one example, but this is a quite big example that has a lot of players that are playing this game and that are paying money for this kind of access, but you not only pay money, what you can do is, like, if you have like two access, you can let them create a kind of child axis. And then the DNAs of the two parent axes will be merged to a new child. So even you can create by playing the game axes that you can then sell. So it's not only a pay to win thing, it's, it's really like transaction based or transactions with the things based on, on a ledger. Maybe some of you have played things like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever kind of trading card games. In the end, it's exactly the same, right? It's moving all these trading cards into, yeah, into the web. And a lot of big companies like Ubisoft or Samsung are really behind this and putting money into this kind of topic that is currently getting bigger and bigger based on public ledgers. How the smart contracts work and, and how something like that can be achieved, we will have a look at in the second part. Mm. So I, I think I already mentioned is what Ethereum has is called ESA. That is the cryptographic coin of the Ethereum platform. And today ESA has a market cap of about 150 billion US dollars. So Bitcoin still have more than double of that but it's already quite impressive. Um, that sounds all good, right, and great. But especially in the Ethereum ecosystem, a lot of problems happened. And this really shows how fragile um, the ecosystem is and how much investment people um, do to get money out of it. So who heard about the DAO hack? Some people have, okay. So what is DAO? DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So there were people who had the idea to create an organization on top of Ethereum. And the idea was that this is a kind of investment company. Think about like an investment company that, for example, invests money in houses. Let's say like in houses, okay? 
And what you can do is you can buy parts of this investment company. Everybody can buy parts of this investment company by paying ESA to the company and then by getting tokens that are executed in smart contracts. And based on this, over smart contracts, if their a house should be bought or sold, you can vote for it. And based on how much part of the company you have, your vote will be exactly put in, into place against all the other votes. And at the end, you have a result that is quite fair based on all the parties that are part of the company. So that was like the idea behind it. Um, and this DAO really raised over 150 million US dollars with this idea. So people spent about 150 million US dollars into that to be part of it, to be part of an open company that is fair and where everybody has like the same rights. Um, sadly, some computer scientists found a bug in the smart contracts of this DAO. And in the time where they tried to fix the bug, hackers get known about this bug or found it too, nobody knows. And they began to steal founts of the DAO based on this bug. And at the end, they stole about 60 million US dollars from, from this DAO. And since this was still at the beginning of Ethereum, that was a quite big problem for the whole community and a quite big amount of the whole Ethereum space that what Ethereum then did is they forked the whole system. This is kind of, kind of strange because they created Ethereum as a blockchain to, you know, everybody has the same rights, everybody can do whatever they do. And then they forked it. And um, there are currently two Ethereums in place. One is called the Classic, or Ethereum Classic, which is the old one. And the fork is what we today know on Ethereum. And since not all parties agreed on, on this fork based on, you know, we shouldn't fork something where we decided this belongs to everybody and, and so on. Um, there's still this Ethereum classic. Um, so that was, yeah, a hard hit for the crypto community. Um, but that's not the only problem or not the only hack that happens. There's really a lot of, of hacks and attacks happen against the cryptocurrency. Still thinking about Axis Infinity. So they had maybe the biggest ha hack in cryptocurrency until today. And this was this year in March, because there are some hackers stolen about 600 million US dollars from this company. Um, the cool thing is that this company really provided a full post-mortem, where they described what happened and how the hackers achieved this money. I don't want to go into technical details because at the end, what the hacker did is nothing technical. What they did is they created a fake company, posted on LinkedIn jobs for this fake company that are 100% perfectly matching for the developers that are working at Access Infinity. Some of the developers from Access Infinity reacted on their job offers they did several rounds with interviews, with real interviews with these people, and then send it, like contracts to these people. And one of the developers opened one of the contracts on the company's computer. And, and this is really how this hack started, right? By doing that, the hacker got access to the network and stole over $600 million out of the Ethereum blockchain. Another point where Ethereum, so the second gen generation, and it's the same for the third, uh, first generation, is not that good from my point of view, is the energy consumption. Um, so the networks are really huge today. And what I did is I tried to find some numbers regarding energy consumption and so on. And um, you find totally different values in the, on, in the internet. I now use some values from Dr. Pete Horson. I don't know him in person or something, but he published several values. So the values that you now see coming from him. And um, yeah, as I said, um, one transaction in Ethereum, you can think about like what a 
household in the US needs over nine days. So that is what one transaction in Ethereum needs today. Bitcoin is even worse. So um, here you see the electricity consumption of Belgium. Sadly, I haven't found it for, for Antwerp. I assume Antwerp is maybe like 10% of that. Um, so this is Belgium. Let's think about where in this chart could be the electricity consumption of Ethereum. Any idea? It's here. So the Ethereum network really needs more electricity or consumes more electricity per, electricity per year than the whole country Belgium. When we have a look at um, CO2 emission in the world, it's not that hard, <laughs> thankfully, but still there, it's about 0.2% of the global emission is created by the Ethereum network, which from my point of view is a really big problem. And Ethereum is working on that. What they did in August, so just two months ago, they, created, they provided a new version from Ethereum. I just call it Ethereum 2.0. They don't want to have it called like that because as a client, you don't need to do any changes. Um, so they still call it Ethereum, but for the slide now, just call it Ethereum 2.0. And what they did is they switched some internal technology. So they switched from a proof of work, we will see later what that is, to a proof of stack approach for the cryptography um, check of um, consents. And hopefully this will have a great impact on the power consumption of the Ethereum network. Um, yeah, this is just the current state. And last but not least, um, we have a third generation, which is quite new, um, which just started. And um, yeah, so Michael and I, we are working um, on that third generation, um, especially here on a product which is called um, Hedera, the Hedera Public Ledger. And um, yeah, you have prepared some numbers, right? Um, yeah, so you can find those numbers on, on the website. So I just go through them very quickly um, just to show you what actually the difference is and why we call it actually a new generation. So here you can see, for example, in the first row, uh, the transactions per second. So Bitcoin has around three, um, Ethereum about 12, um, Hedera about 10,000, and that's actually throttled. Uh, the average fee you can see again, it's uh, around 20 bucks for um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. That's before the merge. Um, uh, one has to say that, to be honest. Um, but as you can see on Hedera and similar third generation ledgers, so Hedera is just one example, but there are others as well, um, the costs are way lower. And just by that, you can already see there are a lot of more business cases you can actually work on uh, with such low transaction fees. Um, yeah, transaction confirmation is way, way uh, um, faster. And also the uh, energy usage, as you can see, is a lot lower. And uh, once again, that's true for all third generation um, ledgers. I'm just showing you Hedera because uh, that's ours, but it's uh, um, true for others as well. And you can see there's really a huge difference and that really makes a big difference when you think about um, um, possible use cases. Um, Hedera is actually um, in, in, in business for quite some years, even though it's not really well known. You can see there are already a million transactions per day running on that. There are more than one million accounts running on mainnet, so that's the production environment. Um, yeah, and you can see that's the latest numbers from Friday. The latency is right now uh, f a little more than five seconds to finality. That means at that point you know that there is consensus. Um, yeah, and we have... Um, um, to see what the costs are. Right now, we have about 580 API calls per H bar, and one H bar is a little bit less than six cents at this point. So you can see it really is that cheap as uh, the numbers shown. So these numbers are really matrices, uh, metrics which are gathered uh, in production right now. Uh, Hedera is organized a little different right now. Uh, it's not really fully distributed with community nodes. That's on the roadmap. We are planning for that. 
Uh, right now we have several council members who are um, steering where the Hedera network should go. You can see some of the number, uh, some of the companies here, and the goal is to have companies, large companies in all kinds of industries distributed all over the world. So here's actually a full list, and there's a new member, Aberdeen, that just uh, was added on, on Friday, or it was announced on Friday, so that's why it doesn't really fit into this layout. Uh, and the goal is to have these council members uh, controlling the Hedera, Hedera network and deciding together what should be done. And this is also a rotating scheme, so the companies will switch after, I don't know, was it two, two or years, three years? Two, two or three years, years yeah. yeah. And, and next to this, they all have notes, right? I, I think that's the Yeah, right now, so they're all running notes. We have yeah. just private notes, but the goal is to uh, go to a community-based note network, and then everybody could run note. And I think that's it about Hedera. So we go back to the technology. Yeah. Um, so what Michael mentioned on one slide is this H-bar, which is like the coin of the Hedera network. So now we already have three coins here on the slides. I hate it. <laughs> I don't want coins. Because, I mean, Bitcoin, yes, has a goal to create a currency that you can use for trading. At Hedera, for example, the only use case for the coins of the Hedera network is to pay the transactions. I mean, if you have a transaction that costs $0.000001 dollar or something, it's quite hard to pay that, right? And, and by having something like the H-bar, that is by default defined as a decimal with more than like um, two, um, what heißt Nachkommastellen? Decimal, I don't know. Yeah, with two like positions. Um, it's, it's much easier to, to calculate what you need to pay. So let's leave everything that is regarding coins behind us. And now let's really concentrate on, on the technologies that you can use on public ledgers. And the first thing, whoops, is the blockchain technology, because this was one of the core concepts of Bitcoin. The whole Bitcoin idea, the whole Bitcoin network is based on a blockchain. So what is a blockchain? I mean, block is in the name, so let's start with a block. A block can contain some data, and I added a timestamp. This is, I just did it for, for me. I mean, a timestamp for, for this example, we don't even need it. So we have some data. Could be anything. Normally, what you do in blockchain, so that blockchains make sense, is that you store transactions into a blockchain. So like, okay, um, person A um, shifted two coins to person B. For example, that is a transaction that can be stored in a blockchain. So that's our cool data ent entity. So now, who's thinking now, hey, that don't make sense. This is, I can do this with whatever I want, right? So I could do this with, um, I don't know, JPA, a simple text file, Java records, Java objects, whatever. Why do I need a, a blockchain to, to store some kind of data like transactions? I don't get it. Um, there are two reasons for that. So let's think about um, we have these transactions that are stored there. And now we have a person that mutates a transaction because he's a person who paid or who received like three coins from another person in this transaction. And now he mutates this transaction and said instead of three coins, hey, I received three million coins from that person. And since the transactions are the truth of the network, now you have a problem. Because now you have a person that has way more coins that he should have, so he get rich. From a maybe data structure, an even worse problem is that you now have a person that has negative coins, which normally shouldn't happen, right? And so what the Bitcoin, uh, what the blockchain does is it provides a way to um, secure the data from that attacks. 
by creating a chain of the data. And what the chain contains is, um, or now what, what each block in the chain contains is a hash of its previous block. So here you can see like the block in the middle has a hash, and this hash value is a hash of the full content of the previous block. And um, if you've never worked with hashes, so what's a hash? In, in general, you can think about a hash functionality is something that maps objects from any type, could be big object, small objects, different objects. In our sample, we have an object that contains data, that is maybe a list of transactions, a timestamp, and a previous hash. So we already have a rich object with subobjects. And as hash function has this as an input, and the output is normally much smaller data with a fixed size in a binary way, like we see here. I mean, this is very small, normally hashes are longer, um, because hashes should have some properties. That's why they should be longer. One thing is um, that hashes must be uniform, which means like if you put two times the same input into a hash function, you should always get the same result. Then it should be fast. Right? So it do, shouldn't cost much memory, it shouldn't cost much time to calculate and hash. Um, then um, one thing that could happen is that two inputs have the same hash. That is fine. That can happen. But a hash, if it's perfectly the hash function, um, it will um, reside in all the po possible hashes that are within the range of has hashes that are possible. So it don't make sense to have a hash function that only creates three different, like two if or something like that. That is way too easy and that wouldn't work. And um, since several inputs, I mean, you have um, an infinite number of inputs, so several inputs can end in the same hash, it's a one-way function, so you can never do it the other way around. So based on a hash, you have no information what was inside. And this is used in, in several places, like, for example, you know it maybe from big downloads, and when you download something from a web page, you can, for example, get the checksum, like the MD5 checksum, so that you can locally check if you really downloaded the correct bytes, or it's used in password storage, right? When you create a product with user accounts and the user can have password, you don't store passwords in the database, you store a hash of the password in the database. And yeah, for an, when we code, something where we always see it is like in, in hash tables, so in corrections that use hashes, like in hash map or in hash set, and so on. And this is used in the blockchain too, as said, to um, have this previous hash that always defines the previous, or that always defines the hash of the whole previous block. And since the previous block contains the hash of that previous block, you can say like, each block really defines the validity of all previous blocks. So if something in the um, blockchain is changed from that point on, all future blocks are invalid. This is one thing that, yeah, this is something where the Bitcoin makes use of, for example, to have this chain and to forbid it that people just change the transactions. The question is, is that already enough to yeah, create something for a currency like Bitcoin to be really safe? Okay, yeah, so I assume most of you have maybe even read already about the data structure. Um, I read a bunch of articles when this was new, and most of these articles actually stopped there. And I was wondering, you know, what, this is just a, a fancy linked list with some checksums. So how does Bitcoin work just because of this data structure? And um, yeah, the question is, is that really enough? And you quickly figure out, no, it's actually not enough, because what if... Um, the company that's hosting your blockchain or your administrator is actually malicious. He could just go um, to the block and instead of just you know, changing one, one value and then all the hashes will be invalid, um, 
the person could just go there and then change everything. You know, it changes one value here, uh, my hack data, um, and then it recalculates the hashes, writes that to the next block, recalculates the hash, and writes that to the next block. And so you could write, uh, rewrite the whole blockchain. It would still be valid, and nobody would be able to figure that out. So what's needed? You need to distribute that. You need to have several copies of them. So here we have uh, Alice, Bob, and Chuck. Evil Chuck tries to change the data somehow. And if he does, we'll quickly figure out, oh, his, um, his blockchain actually looks different. And you don't really have to compare the whole blockchain as long as the blockchain in it, it itself is valid. You just need to compare the last hashes. Um, so that way, Alice and Bob can quickly figure out, oh, Chuck is not really playing fair. Uh, there's something fishy about him, and we kick him out. We don't trust him. As long as there's a majority which has the same um, blockchain, uh, you can quickly figure out who is actually trying to play unfair. Now, in re reality, we have not just uh, three nodes, uh, but dozens or even hundreds or thousands. So it's really hard for an attacker to do this kind of attack and try to convince others that his block blockchain is actually the right one because he needs to be in control of all these different nodes. So the question is, is that enough? And the problem is, no, unfortunately not. It's still um, possible to t attack this kind of uh, setup very easily. So let's say Chuck owns uh, 100 euros um, and he has to pay me and Hendrik 100 euros. Uh, and um, now what he could do is he could send to Alice a transaction and say, I want to pay Michael 100 euros. And at the very same moment, he sends the, uh, the transaction, I want to pay 100 euros to Dave, who's the new um, uh, node owner because Chuck was kicked out. What happens is Alice will check, oh yeah, Chuck uh, owns 100 euros, so no problem, I put that on my blockchain. Dave, on the other hand, also, um, also checks, oh yeah, Chuck has 100 euros, I'll um, put that on our blockchain, it looks good. So now we have a conflict between those two nodes, between those two blockchains, and even though both are um, created in good faith, um, both are valid, um, there's a problem here. And that's actually where the interesting part starts uh, when we talk about public ledgers. We need to find a way how Alice, Bob, and Dave can actually agree on an order of these transactions. Because once you have an order, it's clear that Chuck cannot spend um, his money twice. This double spending problem is a huge problem, and consensus uh, solves that. So once everybody agrees on the same order, you can just do the first transaction, for example, sending the money to me. Um, I'll be happy. And then when the second transaction comes in, everybody will figure out, oh, there's no money left on Chuck's account. So uh, the second transaction uh, will, will fail. Um, yeah, and this consensus algorithms, that's actually the, the interesting part where the different blockchains, uh, blockchain implementations um, differ and where it really, uh, really makes sense to look into that and, and um, spend some time with that. Um, there are basically five different concepts, how you can reach consensus, and all of them have their pro and cons. So the um, probably best known is proof of work because that's what Bitcoin does. Proof of work means all the nodes have to solve some, some difficult um, um, problem, and the one who's first can actually define what the next block will look like. Um, so what could this problem be? Um, you, uh, we remember we have these blocks, so we need to cr uh, calculate the hash. And the problem is now find uh, a number, an arbitrary number that you add to this block. So you have a new field, um, so this arbitrary number. Find a number so that the hash that's calculated from that block is below a certain uh, number or be below a certain size. And the interesting part about that problem is First of all, it's really hard to find that number because you actually basically have to try different uh, numbers until you, can, um, until you find a hash that's smaller than the limit. But once you have that number, you can quickly validate that this is correct. So it's um, um, exactly what you want for this kind of work. You want uh, a lot of work for the, uh, for the node that's... Uh, trying to, uh, to solve this problem, but once you have a solution, you want that everybody can quickly validate that it's correct. 
Another interesting feature about this kind of problem is you can actually adjust um, how hard the problem is. Um, the lower this limit is, the harder it becomes to find a hash that's below that uh, limit. So you can actually, uh, if you figure out, oh, it's, it's uh, the, the, the chain is too, or the, the blockchain or the, the nodes are too fast, you can make the problem harder. Or if you figure out the pro um, they take too long, you can make the problem easier by changing the limit of that um, specific problem. So it works. We can see that in Bitcoin. We have seen that in Ethereum. Proof of work, of work works. But it has a whole bunch of problems. The first one is, uh, by doing proof of work, you actually try to slow down every node. Every node should spend some time um, um, to figure out the solution. And by making every, uh, making every node slower, the whole consensus um, algorithm is really slow. I mean, we've seen that it takes several minutes or even an hour until you find a solution that everybody agrees on. It's really um, um, a problem that this, by design, is a slow algorithm. Another problem is the, the, um, the, the algorithm or what you're trying to achieve is totally useless. Nobody actually cares what this hash is. I mean, you don't hear, hear, uh, help humanity at all by calculating that. And now there are hundreds or thousands of nodes calculating, trying to solve a problem that actually isn't helpful for anybody. So it's just wasting a lot of energy um, and wasting a lot of computational resources. Um, there are a bunch of other problems. So people figure out proof of work is actually, it works, but it's not really what we want in the future. Another possibility is uh, the leader-based algorithm. So here you pick a leader, all of the nodes pick a leader, and that leader decides uh, what the next node or the next block will look like. Problem with that approach is um, it's very, very vulnerable <coughs> to, to um, distributed denial of service attacks because now instead of the whole network and all the nodes, you just need to attack this one leader um, and that's it. Um, Another problem is it's not really fair because now this leader picks whatever transaction goes first and goes second. Um, and if you look, for example, at stock exchanges, how important it is to be the first one who's actually submitting a transaction, that's a huge problem. Now people say, okay, we just don't pick one leader, we're just taking turns. Uh, but that doesn't really solve the problem. It solves the fairness a little bit because now it takes a while until your malicious uh, computer maybe um, becomes the leader and can, can change um, the, or manipulate the order of the transactions. But it's still vulnerable to the den denial of service attack because you, can, you just have to um, attack the current leader. And if the leader is taking turns, you just redirect the denial of service attack. So it's not really a um, good algorithm as well. It, it has its problem. Um, the third one is an economy-based um, kind of algorithm. So here you try to um, come up with the uh, economy um, or, or, or some economy model so that if nodes are actually acting in their best interest, trying to make the most money, um, everything will work out and play fair. So a very simple one could be, for example, um, nodes decide on, on uh, what node, uh, what will be the next block, um, and everybody who votes for the, uh, for the choice that will be taken at the end gets some money, and everybody who's voting on a block that doesn't get anything is losing money. So that way, everybody tries to find um, the block that, is, uh, um, that, is, that the majority picks. And that way, you could define such a very simple system. But the problem with anything that's kind of economy basis, it's very complex. We are not really sure if that works. Up until today, we haven't really figured out how to set up an economy, um, a stock market, for example, that doesn't crash, where no bubbles exist. So if you do something economy-based, um, there's always a huge risk that there are some subtle um, attack uh, attacks possible 
um, that things go out of band um, just because of the economics. And it's really hard, or it's actually so far we weren't able to find any model where this would work and is provable working without any outliers. So fourth possibility is voting-based. Voting-based uh, works great. It's been uh, explored for decades, um, not for blockchains, but uh, for distributed systems, for example. Um, you, all the nodes vote together, and the one block that most people, uh, that most nodes uh, vote for, that one gets picked, would be voted based. Problem with that is, in theory, it works great. You can prove how it's um, um, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, with, which is the golden standard for such uh, systems. Um, the problem is, it's not practical. It has never been implemented by anybody because the communication that this would uh, require is, in, is immense. If you have a 1,000 nodes and they want to vote on something, then these 1,000 nodes have to send their votes to 1,000 other nodes. So now you have 1 million messages that need to be sent. Uh, now, if you, those nodes um, also need to send back or, or, or notify everybody that the, notes, uh, that the votes were received, you're suddenly at 1, million, uh, 1 billion um, messages that need to be sent. So while in theory it works great, it can be proven that these systems are fair and working correctly, from a practical point of view, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Or you can't really implement that. So the third, uh, the fifth uh, alternative is virtual voting. And that's, for example, what Hedera is doing. So um, you send around all the transaction that should be, um, should be added to the, to the blockchain. Um, you send that to all the nodes. But you add some more information. You don't just send all the transactions that need to be uh, voted to all the nodes using a gossip protocol. But um, you're also sending information about which node was talking to which other node. And when you do that, then every node knows what the other nodes knew at a certain point in time. And then they can actually calculate the voting for them, um, which is really extremely helpful because you get all the benefits of the voting algorithms, but without all the communication that needs to be done. Because your nodes know what the other nodes, what kind of information they had at a, per, a certain point, they can just reevaluate and recalculate what they would have voted, and then they can base their decisions on that. And it's not necessary to do any more communication just to figure out what the voting should be like. Um, it's a little more complex, I think. There are very good uh, videos on YouTube, for example, where these kind of algorithms are explained. And I recommend to take a look because here <laughs> um, time is really not sufficient. You could probably fill a full hour just talking about how this is implemented and how this should be done. So um, I leave it with that and I encourage you to take a look at those videos um, about virtual voting and the hash graph, which is our implementation of virtual voting, for example. So what are use cases for a blockchain? First of all, obviously currency, that was the first one, that's what um, everybody's aware of, and it's probably um, not that interesting from my point of view if you're a developer. Uh, but what are other use cases where you can use that? So one is, for example, supply chain management. Um, a public ledger is a huge lock that cannot be al altered by anybody, but it's also not owned by anybody because it just, it's uh, just um, available on all the nodes. So in supply chain management, you often have the problems. There are suppliers, there are um, other companies who get the, uh, the get this stuff, do some, some work with that, send it to the next one, um, and you would like to track what's happening there. Um, but the question is, how do you track that? And how do you make it available to everybody? And how do you make sure that uh, nobody is really um, messing around with the data? And the blockchain is one possibility where this is being used today already to make this um, tracking and uh, supply chain management a lot easier. Another possibility are digital entities. It's, again, a very similar problem. You have some data that you want to um, 
um, share with different companies or, or different organizations. How do you actually um, store that so it's not really just stored in, in one place? Like you can certainly upload everything to Google and then Google owns this stuff and you have to trust Google that they don't mess around with it. By using a blockchain, um, you can have all your data there or actually in reality, you certainly don't want to have your personal data on a blockchain because everybody can read a blockchain. You store it somewhere else, but you use the blockchain to prove that the, uh, that the data that, you had, that you've stored somewhere else is valid and it's really yours. And that's uh, that you can present by signing that data or you can ensure that this is really your data. Um, and digital medical records, very similar. You have some medical record that you want to use in different occasions for different doctors. And instead of the doctor just storing the data in his, in his, uh, on his computer, and when you go to another doctor, you have a problem, you need to figure out how this medical data can get over there. You could use a blockchain um, to have that in a central place and um, provide the information that the doctor need at the moment when you need it. Uh, without having to trust a single entity. That's really important here. So basically, every time when you want to have some kind of a lock, um, where you want to store data that needs to be available to several organizations, to, uh, to several entities, but um, you don't want a single entity to control it and to own it, that's always a good um, use case where blockchain could be used. Um, yeah, I think we do the break now. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because we exactly did like one hour for now, we will do a short break. So, if you are missing code or like deep dive in, into the technique, that will come next, right? So, this was like the introduction what is a blockchain? What is crypto at all, and so on. So the next, after a short break, we will talk about smart contracts. We will even learn a new programming language that we need to, yeah, use to create smart contracts. And then we will see how to execute them on a public ledger. I would say like a five-minute break, maybe. What do you ten think? Ten minutes. I ten minutes. Ten minutes. So we do a ten minutes break. Um, we will be back in ten minutes and. Yeah, then we will have a look at smart contracts. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. So, um, for the second part, again, we've prepared like um, two questions where I would like you again um, to, to answer them. So it's, it's like before you can just scan that, that code with your mobile and, and we have then two questions where we would like you to answer them. Um, so, yeah, several people already answering. So if, if, if you um, haven't scanned it, you can still go to menti.com and then use the code which is shown above to, to answer the question. So the first question is, since this is a topic we would like to talk about now, is if you ever heard something about smart contracts? Okay, a lot of people already heard about smart contracts. That's, that's good. But mostly all people have no idea what smart contracts are really are. I hope that we can help you with that point in a minute. Okay, cool. Um, let me go like to the next question. We have a second one. Um, because the third part, as said, is about tokens. And here we just want to know if there are people who own NFTs, like pictures of apes, for example, or this funny Axis Animal NFTs. Okay, there are some people who own NFTs. Interesting. Yeah, I, I belong to the group 
No to. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. And let's um, continue our session. And as said, the next topic will be smart contracts. And yeah, you will start with that one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, before we look into the technology and how it works, uh, let's first actually figure out why uh, smart contracts can be useful. So there's a very simple example that I have here. Let's say Alice and Bob want to, um, want to gamble. They want to bet on the outcome of the next uh, soccer game of their favorite team, maybe. Um, so what can, can they do? I mean, if they are friends and they trust each other, it's not a problem, but, but let's just assume they actually don't know each other or they don't trust each other. So what can they do? What you usually do is you go to a bookkeeper, um, both of them pay their, um, their or deposit their, their, um, their money, and at the end, um, when the game is over, uh, the, the bookmaker will just check it um, and then will pay out some fee. Now there are a bunch of, or there are mostly two problems with this approach. One is um, that person usually takes a fee and that's actually quite big. So instead of, I mean, both just paid uh, 100 uh, euros, um, but now they're just getting out 180 and the rest is just kept for, you know, transaction, whatever. Um, so it's actually quite expensive to introduce such a third company whom you need to establish the trust between the two of you. Um, the other problem is you actually have to trust that third person. You don't really know. Kara could just take those 200 euros and disappear, and you could really not do a lot about that. Um, so and to, to overcome these kind of problems, um, smart contracts were introduced. Now, what is a smart contract? I think the biggest problem with uh, smart contracts is the name, <laughs> because uh, smart contracts are neither really smart nor are they actually contracts. Um, what you could think about them as a software developer, we have kind of an advantage here. They're actually more like an endpoint, an, a REST endpoint, for example, that executes some functionality. And instead of having that in a web browser, it's running on the, um, on the network on the node network, Ethereum, for example, or Hedera, or, or the other um, uh, networks that offer that kind of fun uh, functionality. And what you could do now is, uh, this smart contracts has an interface that's well-defined. You can call methods on that. And then um, there is code deployed that everybody can take a look at and analyze. And then it can react based on that code. So it's really very comparable to web server except that it's, uh, it's secure. So now looking at our gambling example, Alice and Bob bo both pay uh, 100 euros. And now the payout is much higher because everything is automated. Um, you don't really have high costs. You just have to pay for the network. So it does its work. And you get most of the money back. And you don't lose as much money for the transaction. Um, what are typical use cases for these kind of uh, um, for, for smart contracts or actually those programs that are stored in the network. You can check them out. You can download the code and analyze it, analyze it if you want to, or you have companies who does do that for you. Um, the whole communication is actually secured, so you know exactly who's calling that. So it's very much like an endpoint, but it's much more secure, and you know who's talking to whom, and you know what's actually happening, because the code doesn't change of a smart contract. Once it's, it's deployed, um, it doesn't change. So typical use cases are decentralized finance. Um, that's probably the first one or the biggest one currently. Um, so you can do, for example, an exchange that's way cheaper. Let's say, for example, you want to trade um, um, dollars against euros, you can have a pool of dollars on one side, a pool of euros on the other side, and then if somebody wants to um, exchange that money, you pay it in in one pool and you get it out of the other pool, and um, uh, it's way cheaper than actually asking your, your bank to do that kind of exchange. Um, and you can automate everything, you can code that so that there are, there are no people involved in that. Um, that's just one example how you could use um, smart contracts for 
uh, in the field of decentralized finance. Yeah, basically, in all kind of peer-to-peer -peer markets, you could use smart contracts easily. So um, let's think about um, something like, like eBay or um, all the other markets that exist out, out there where people are actually trading against each other. Um, those uh, markets actually take quite a high fee from the people who try to trade something there, and you could actually automate that and simplify that for all kinds of peer-to-peer -peer markets. And yeah, we have already mentioned that in the hacked. Another very interesting use case in my point of view are decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. Um, those or DAOs, you can, um, those are organizations where the rules of the participants of that organization are actually encoded, so they are coded. They could, as uh, um, Henrik mentioned in this example, for example, those DAOs could um, invest in shares. And um, so everybody gets who's in that organization can do votes, and based on that vote, um, the uh, organization would react so that you can organize your, um, yeah, your, your communication and everything that you need to do by automating it using such smart contracts. Um, that's just another example that's currently explored. Although, to be fair, the problems here are not necessarily really the technical problems, that, but the legal problems. Um, there are some big um, legal cases right now happening in the US where, where actually people try to figure out, okay, so if I want to sue such an organization, who is actually the one that needs to be sued? That's an interesting question that nobody has an answer to because they are just... It's actually just some code somewhere in the network, and people are just um, voting on, on stuff. Who actually owns that, and who could be um, sued if bad things happen? So these are just um, some examples of what's possible with smart contracts. But now, how do they actually work? Um, to understand a smart contract, um, we have to understand there is a, an... Um, uh, a virtual machine running on those different nodes, and that virtual machine behaves like a state machine. So it has a certain state, then a transaction comes in, and a transaction, unlike uh, in the case of Bitcoin, where a transaction just means, you know, transfer some value from A to B, um, a transaction now can include um, a call to a specific smart contract. So it says which contract to call and what the parameters are. When this transaction comes in, the, EV, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, so the virtual machine running there, does its work, and at the end, um, the, the uh, EVM is in a new state. So let's take a look at what this state actually looks like to get a better understanding. Um, so we have the world state, that's the state of the whole virtual machine, and that's split in several accounts, and each account um, consists of an address, that's the way how you can actually um, access or, or talk to a certain account, and then it has some state. So you can think of it, it's maybe a huge table that you've stored in there. So what does it look like, um, these, these uh, account states? There are actually two types of accounts. One are uh, externally owned accounts, these are accounts that are owned by users. They are co controlled by a private key that this user had and has, and with this private key, they can actually start transaction and talk to that. Um, the account state is very simple. There is a, a, a nonce, which is just uh, um, identifying which was the last transaction that was transmitted by this account, and it has a balance, which is how much money or how much Ethereum's, in the case of uh, the Ethereum network, this account owns. And that's, I mean, there are, there are some more um, um, technical details. There's a little bit more, but that's basically all there is, and that's really important. On the other hand, we have um, an account that is controlled by a smart contract. So a smart contract actually has an account, you could say. So there's an address. It also has this nonce, which is... a uh, um, an, an identifier of the last transaction that was done. It has a balance, so it can own money. 
and then it has a storage hash, so it points to some kind of storage where, where the, uh, the data of that account is stored, and it has some code, obviously, somewhere stored, so it stores a reference to that hash. Um, and that's maybe a little tricky to understand initially, that we have two types of accounts now, one for the users, for the people, and one for the uh, uh, one type for smart contracts. Um, but now we have better understanding what that state actually means, so let's take a look at what these kind of transactions actually, what they look like. We have different types of transactions. There are regular transactions. These are the ones where we just transfer money. So that's what we had at Bitcoin already, and that's also available in other um, blockchain uh, blockchains. Um, then we have a contract deployment transaction. So if you want to deploy a new contract, that's actually also a transaction. So you pass in, um, yeah, you, you pass in the code, and then the virtual machine creates a new address, creates this new state, set up, sets up um, the data and stores the storage, and you get back the address of that new contract that you just created. And last but not least, we have um, a third type, which is the execution of a transaction. So um, this contract has now an address, and when you um, send a transaction to that specific address, you're calling the contract, and you can specify some parameters. Over there, we can see um, the, uh, the properties that these transactions have. There is, of course, the recipient, so the one, the address that's actually um, or supposed to receive the transaction. We have a signature that's needed so that we can identify the, um, the account that was actually sending the transaction or the person. Uh, we have a nonce, again, that's the idea of the transaction so that we can make sure that this is really a transaction that was sent by the specific account. We have a value, so we can transmit values. And then there's the new interesting stuff, we have data. In the case of a contract deployment transaction, the data is actually the code that you want to deploy. And the, um, for the uh, execution of a contract, this data are the parameters that you want to provide to that contract. And then uh, we have the gas limit, um, the max priority fee per gas. Uh, we go into that a little bit, uh, we go into that a little later. Um, just a couple of slides, but just as an explanation, uh, explanation up front, um, you have to pay gas when you call a contract. Gas is, you can say, it's like you're, you're providing some money, and for each operation, um, you have to pay actually some money, um, and then at the end, you get everything that's left back. That's a very interesting concept. It's for security measurements. It's important because that way you can uh, make sure that there's not a single... Um, contract call that's just blocking everything because uh, by, by, for example, executing an endless loop because you're constantly reducing the gas, um, the money that um, was transmitted, and at some point you run out of gas and then this transaction will be, or, or this execution will be um, cancelled. All right, so these are just the basic concept. What, what is the state? What does it look like um, from a very high level? And uh, what are transactions? And how do they look like? So let's take a look at the Ethereum, Ethereum virtual machine. Now, when you hear virtual machine as a Java developer, um, this is, I think, very familiar, uh, this kind of um, concept that we have for the Ethereum virtual machine as well. There are different languages. Um, solid, solidity is um, <laughs> the most used one, I guess. Uh, Viper is also an interesting one. FE and, and Yule are more like, they're in development, so um, they're not used really, I think, in production so much. But the uh, Solidity and Viper are um, heavily used. So you write your code in one of these languages. Then you compile that to bytecode, very similar how it's done in, um, in Java. So you write your code in Java, it gets compiled to bytecode, uh, same here. And this bytecode gets deployed to the virtual machine and is executed in there. Um, when we look at the virtual machine, how it's set up, we have a rough overview of how the state is organized here. 
On, on the left hand side, we see there is some virtual ROM. That's the code actually that's being executed while you execute um, a smart contract. So, and this one is immutable. You can never change that code. Once it's deployed, it's there forever um, and, and, and cannot be modified. And just to be clear, because a lot of people think here, this is stupid. Um, everybody knows that you cannot write really good, complex, bug-free software. You need to have a way to uh, modify, um, modify code later on if you find bugs or security leaks. And there are concepts how you actually do that. Um, but the smart contract by itself cannot be modified. But what you can do, for example, is um, um, you have a proxy which you call, and that proxy then decides which of the different versions of another smart contract you have. So you write everything with one smart, uh, with one smart contract, so you establish a proxy, uh, the user asks uh, or sends his transaction to that proxy, and this one goes to the um, smart contract that you deployed, and if at some point you find there are bugs, there are security leaks, you can deploy a second version, and then you um, change that proxy so it points to the second um, implementation. That's one example how, if, for example, you can actually change an application running on Ethereum um, even though a smart contract itself cannot be changed. All right, that's the virtual ROM, and then you have the machine state. There is... Uh, um, there's the gas that's provided. So when you do a call, you provide a certain amount of gas, which is H bars, um, for example, in the case of Hedera, which is Ethereum in the case of, uh, or, um, in, in the case of Ethereum. Um, and this is kept so that we know how much gas is available for that call. Uh, you have the program counter, which is tracking in which, um, um, where, you're current, where you're currently in the program. Then there is a stack, where you can store um, yeah, what, what you're currently working with. So it's a stack-based machine, this virtual machine. Interestingly, there are no registers, so that's a huge difference to the Java virtual machine where you usually deal with registers. Here we just have a stack. Um, but we are, I, I thought it was kind of weird that there's just a stack, but then when you look into it, you. Um, you read that actually it's possible to not only look at the, the first element, the top element of that stack, but you can look at the, f the first 16 elements of that stack. So I guess that's kind of um, replacing a register in, in a usual um, virtual machine. Yeah, and then you have memory, uh, which is volatile. So this one is just used during one smart contract call. So when you call this smart contract, there you have some memory where you can store things, um, which has random access. Oh, we see that on the next slide, I just realized. Um, yeah, and then last but not least, there's the account storage, and that's where you store your persistent storage. Um, so, so that's more or less a key value store where you can store things, and they are kept between different calls to that smart contract. Yeah, here we can see the uh, execution model. So the uh, EVM code comes in. Um, you have the program counter, which is tra tracking which um, instruction is currently uh, being um, operated or what you're currently working on. We have the gas, where, you, where we track how much gas was already used. And then we have push pops and other operations to talk to the stack. And then we can uh, do random access calls to the account storage and um, the memory. Now, what do these? Um, what does this bytecode look like? I just picked um, the first seven or eight that are available, so you can see um, they have certain names. There is a definition what you is um, expected on the stack initially. Um, you have what's what the result is with the description. Um, I think that's familiar if you ever looked at the bytecode or how the bytecode for a Java virtual machine is defined. What's interesting is the third column. So each of these operations has some gas amount um, 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 defined. So every time such an operation is being executed, this gas is um, uh, removed from your, from your supply. So here we can see that in a, um, in a diagram. So Alice is... Uh, uh, starting a transaction using her account. So from that account, we supply some gas to the smart contract. Um, 
the smart contracts does its magic, and then it refunds everything that's left. So you're providing a maximum, um, the execution reduces some of that, and the refund gets back to you. Here's a more detailed um, model, how this looks like. Um, so again, we, we see how, uh, how the execution model looks like, but now we can also see where gas is being used. So on the left-hand side, we see that the current level is tracked at some point. Each operation, as we just saw, um, costs some gas, so we reduce that, but also storing something in the account storage, so that's the uh, persistent storage, storing something there costs gas, and also calling other smart contracts costs gas. So one smart contract can call other smart contracts, and you also have to provide some, a gas supply, and then the second uh, smart contract does its magic and sends the refund back. So that's very similar. So that's also a point where you uh, lose gas. And it's a very important um, concept to understand, and which is also very unique compared to um, the Java VM, for example, where everything is free. All right, so let's take a look at uh, some of the languages that are or uh, available that you can use. And here we can see a simple example of the uh, Sol Solidity. I'm still having troubles to, with that name. Um, what this code looks like, and let's get through this step by step. So first of all, we have the version Pragma. So Pragma are compiler instructions. You can tell the compiler certain instructions, and ver the, the very important one is which version of the language are you actually using here. Next is the contract, so that's the, yeah, the, the top level building block of a smart contract, and you can define it like that. Here we have state variables. So remember, we had this, um, um, this account memory, and that's, that's persistent, and that's what these state variables are for. So if you store something in there, and the smart contract gets called a later point, uh, this value is stored here. We have events. So if something happens and you want to notify the outside world about it, you can define an event, you can emit this event, and then the um, outside world will be informed about um, this event. There's a constructor, um, yeah, I think very similar to what we know. I mean, Solidity is, Solidity is uh, inspired from languages like C++, Java, JavaScript, so it, I think most of that looks very um, um, familiar to you. And then we have some functions here which actually define the interface that is being called. Um, we, have some we have the possibility to define visibility, so these are public functions. That means um, other accounts can call this, these functions, but it's also possible to define private functions, for example, that are only uh, available to your smart contract. Okay, let's look at the whole, um, um, whole implementation again, and let's figure out what it does. So there's the constructor. The constructor is called um, the first time when you deploy the smart contracts. That's actually when the smart contract is created, and this is when the constructor is called. And what we do here is we store who sent that, um, that contract. The message, that's something like an environment variable, like a global object, with uh, some information about who sent or the message that was sent. And here we uh, take out the sender and store it in the, uh, in the address or in the, in the minter field at the top. Um, and now we have two methods. We can mint values and we can send values. Mint is we create new or um, we want to create a um, new, new, uh, uh, new value because what this smart contract actually does, it implements something like a very simple currency. And minting means you want to create new, um, um, yeah, new value or, or new entities, or yeah, you want to increase the amount of that. So there's the require um, keyword, and when you use that, you're actually checking some um, um, condition, and if that condition fails, the whole um, transaction will be reverted. It's an interesting, uh, that's an important concept when you 
call a smart contract, you, uh, uh, you fire that transaction, it can only succeed, then it runs through the whole thing and is successful, or if it fails, everything will be reverted. So there's no in-between. Um, all the changes that happen will be reverted once you, uh, uh, if, if a message or if, if such a call fails. So we make sure that the sender, the person who's actually calling this mint function, is uh, the same as the minter, because we want to make sure that only the person who created this account is able to, uh, to change the value and nobody else. So we check that, and when that's fine, we um, add some amount to the... Uh, uh, um, uh, we add some, um, some value to the balances of these receiver. The balances that we can see up there is, is a mapping, so something like, a, a, well, well, it's a map in Java. You can think of it, it maps addresses on values, and that stores how much um, of your currency each account has. Address is identifying the, the, uh, the externally owned account or the smart contracts you're talking about. Um, and the uint is actually storing the value. So what you're doing here, you're increasing the amount for that specific receiver that was uh, the first parameter of that method call. And then we have a second function which allows anybody to send um, some money from your currency to somebody else. And here we check that the amount that you want to send somebody is actually available, that there is some that you have that amount. Um, so we check that. If it fails, um, nothing will happen. Uh, and once, but once you do that, uh, or if you have enough um, balance in your account, we subtract the amount from your account and we add it to the amount um, uh, to the balance of the receiver. And then we emit the send event so that the outside world um, participants <coughs> who are listening for this specific event get notified that the balance changed at that point. So if you ever wanted to have your own cryptocurrency, deploy that smart contract on Hedera and you have it, right? Because this does everything that you need for it. No, you shouldn't do that. Uh, we don't need more cryptocurrencies. And you need to do more, actually. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so let's take a, a look at the language. Um, some, some parameters that you get an idea what it looks like. We have certain value types. They're booleans, they're integers. For integers, you can define how many bits they should have. So it's anything between 8 um, until 256. And actually, by default, it's always using 256, um, which is weird. I have no idea why this actually uh, is, because it's a huge number, but, uh, but that's the way it is. Everything in the virtual machine is based on 256-bit integers, unsigned and, uh, and signed. Uh, they are fixed point numbers, but that's a work in progress. So that's um, something um, people are working on right now. You typically use one of these integers and you just say, for example, the last two digits are actually your fraction um, instead of using fixed point numbers or yeah, there are no flow po floating point numbers, as you can see. Addresses, they are also an interesting um, value type that you don't have in other languages, and that's the identifier of your account. So that's um, a type by itself. Byte arrays, yeah, pretty obvious. They are fixed and dynamically sized byte arrays, and there are also enums possible in Solidity. Then we have um, some reference types. We have an array, we have a map, we already saw that, and uh, we have a struct with which you can organize your um, code. Yeah, no surprises when we look at the control structures. We have if else, we have while do loops, we have for loops, we have break and continue, and we have return statements to control the uh, control flow. Should be obvious, I think, for all uh, for Java developers. The error handling is interesting, definitely, and uh, it's diff uh, and because it's different from what we know from Java. Um, the first thing is it's state reverting. So as I said, a transaction can only succeed or everything is rolled back. That means if an error occurs while a, con a smart contract is being executed, the whole state is reverted automatically. And it's like as if 
nothing has happened except that you lost the gas you, that you paid for that. Um, that's always important to keep in mind. We have something like try-catch, try which is similar to what we have in Java. Uh, we have require that we already saw, so we can um, check certain conditions and revert everything if the conditions are not met. And then we have a revert keyword, which allows us to revert um, yeah, our, our um, smart contract or the call, the transaction, um, ourselves. Okay, the other languages I will not go into that much detail. Um, I'll just post an example. So here we can see the very same uh, functionality written in Viper. So this is language that's um, inspired by Python. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's mostly a matter of preference which one you, you use. Um, yeah, then there's this language, which is a work in progress, more or less, and that's actually, you're not really expected to write in that language, um, but it's an intermediate result. So the idea is you take one of these high-level languages, like Solidity, uh, you compile that uh, to, to um, Ewell, and then this gets compiled to the bytecode. And this one is very close to the bytecode. It should be the... Um, yeah, the, the idea is that it should be straightforward how this gets compiled into bytecode. Um, but there are some, um, um, there's some functionality which makes it easier for developers to actually understand what's going on. So, for example, you have control uh, flow um, 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 possibilities like, uh, um, do I have it here? Switch. Yeah, you have a switch statement. You can define loops. Um, that's what I was actually looking for. No, there's no loop in here. Um, so that it's easier to understand, but at the same time, uh, you have a very good feeling of what's actually going on in the virtual machine because it's so close to the bytecode. And the idea is to use that for optimizations or, e or, or trying to figure out um, bugs that are hard to find out with a high-level language. Um, and then there's... FE, also worth mentioning, which is kind of a fork of the uh, Viper. You can see it's also based on Python and it's very similar in many aspects. Also something that's being developed right now. Yeah, and that's just a rough overview of the languages. Um, I think they are actually quite easy to learn for Java developer, especially the first one. Um, or if you're more into Python, then certainly uh, Viper is also a good option. Yeah. And let's have a look how we can use those language to create smart contracts and to run them on the ledger. I mean, Michael already showed us a lot about the Solidity language, and I will continue to use that one. So um, when having a smart contract written in such language, since we want to execute it on a virtual machine, First, most important thing we need to do is we need to compile it somehow to create bytecode out of it, right? So let's start with an even much easier smart contract than the one that um, Michael showed you. So this is a kind of Hello World smart contract written in Solidity. Um, it has one additional line that Michael haven't. This is the first line, which is a comment. This is really just a comment, but if you don't uh, define a license, um, the compiler already sh always shows a warning. You can even show, uh, define um, unknown as a license or something like that, but without this line, you will get an, um, yeah, an error. And I mean, maybe JavaScript developers like the second line. I don't get it why I should define a version range. Um, but yeah, so the rest is just a contract that just has one method that is called Creed, and this um, just returns in Hello World. Um, that's it. And what we want to do is we want to compile this, and that is quite easy. I mean, it's exactly the same as in Java. So what, you can, what we need to do is we need to use the Solidity compiler, which is called so you see, so that the um, command, for example, on the command line interface. And we can use that one to create a binary, so a compiled contract. If you want to play with that, 
the easiest thing that you can do is use Remix. Remix is an IDE that is coming from the Ethereum community, and that is just working in the browser. So you can just go to remixethereum.org and play with your or, or create smart contracts and try to compile them. So let's let's have a look. Um, we can just go to. Um, to the page, let's see if it's working. I hope we have good internet here. Here we go, and now let's go to some kind of contract, like the Hello Hedera contract. Here we have a contract, so you, I mean, it's an IDE, right? So I don't want to go deeper into that one now. You can write all your things. And what you can do, for example, now is you can um, compile um, any of these smart contracts. And we have a compile view here where you then, um, so we have the, the Hero Hedera contract that we just compiled. And here I could now, that is a little bit complex because the IDE, um, the goal is to directly publish it from the IDE. But what you could do is you could even now here by the link copy the bytecode and save it into a file to have it on, on your machine. But as a first step, just um, without installing anything using this editor is fine. But definitely nothing you want to use at production, right? So when you really want to write um, smart contracts, you want to have the compiler installed. Um, there are absolutely different ways how you can download and install it. There's, uh, it supports Poo, you can use NPM if you're a JavaScript developer, and so on. And once you've have installed it, you can just use it like that. So here we say we want to create a binary. That's, that's quite interesting, right? Because what should the compiler create other than a binary? We'll have a look at that in a second. Then we define the output folder that should create our binary. And then we just define the um, input, which is in that point the .sol, which is the um, um, suffix for um, um, solidity, smart contracts, um, yeah. And based on this, we get a binary. We can just have a look at an example. I think now we need only the IDE anymore. So what I have here in my IDE, I'm a Java developer, so I created a source main contract where I have my um, Hello World contract. It's exactly the same that we've seen on the um, slides some moments ago. And what I can do now is I want to have it compiled under target contracts. Right? So like what maybe a Maven plugin or something like that would, would do. Um, so let me just copy the command that is easier because it contains the source main contract. Boop, boop, boop. So it's like that. And if I just execute the command, compiler one successfully, artifacts can be found. Um, once in IntelliJ, ah, here we go. And here we have the binary. Yeah, this is the, the compilation of the smart contract. You already see that I have a second file because next to minus minus bin, I added this minus minus ABI. What's that? Um, and out of the sudden, my keynote broke up. Oh no, here we are again. Um, so next to the um, binary, you, the compiler of Solidity provides several additional outputs. One is the ABI, which is the application binary interface. In general, you can think about it like an API description because it looks like that, what you see on the left, right? So for my um, smart contract, the ABI that is defined in JSON by default uh, describes a method that is called creed that has no input parameters but has an output parameter of type string. So what this does, it, it really defines like the public API of your smart contract so that any additional tools can, for example, 
read this file and provide dynamic access to your smart contract by showing what functions could be called and so on. Um, we can then just have a look at the file. Um, if I open this one, you see, oh, it's not. Uh, hmm. I don't know why it's not. Ah, yeah. It's not supported because it's not a JSON, right? Why is it not? So I don't know why it's currently not formatted, but I mean you see it, right? So it's at the end what what we've already seen earlier. Um, next to this, the um, compiler even provides more output. It even provides a JSON file as an input where you can store all the um, configurations for the um, compiler, and it even supports a JSON as an output that not only contains the ABI, but even the bytecode as a field in the JSON. That is quite nice if you want to call the compiler from any tooling, like if you, for example, create a Maven plugin that will execute the compiler and, and then result in some kind of JSON that you can then use to easily store the binaries and so on, wherever you want to have it. So a lot of... Um, different kinds of output. If you want to play with it and do not want to install the compiler on your machine, because you want to play with a lot of new technologies, and if you install everything on your machine, yeah, in near future you maybe need to reset up everything because something broke your machine. One good thing is that there is a Docker container from these um, yeah, Ethereum Foundation that contains the Sol C compiler that you can use to do all the things we've just seen. So you can, if you have Docker installed, you can just use the Docker compiler to do a compilation. Here we see um, one example. So what we need to do, or what I'm doing here, is I mount a folder, which is the contracts folder, into the um, container image and then I've, yeah, the, the so C compiler is automatically called, and I just add the minus O, minus, minus ABI, minus, minus bin parameters to it. Um, we can even do this in my setup. Um, here it's a little bit more complex based on the source main contract thing and so on. So if we have a look at the um, readme here, you see what I'm doing. So I call a Docker one. I mount my um, source main contracts folder as contracts in the container and my target contracts folder as output. And then I just call it with these parameters. And this will do at the end exactly the same as um, we've seen before. So it will, be, it will start the compiler and we will get the binary. So once we have the binary, um, the next step we want to do is we want to we want to deploy the smart contract to a public ledger. Um, in the following example, I will now use um, the Hedera ledger, but you could in theory do the exactly same, for example, by using Ethereum. Um, for the Hedera Ledger, there are open source APIs available for the programming languages that you see on, on the bottom. Um, I will show all the samples by using the Java API. We have a documentation. The link is on the top. There you find like samples and, and documentation of the API for Java, JavaScript, Go, and so on. Um, since everything that we are doing is, is open source, you can find it at um, GitHub. And what we need to do to create a Java ac um, application, we only need to add the SDK as a Maven dependency. And once we have it, we can start. So um, what Michael told us is that when I put a smart contract to, to this network, I need to pay for it. When I want to execute a smart contract call function, 
I need to pay for it. So, which means like as a developer, I need to pay a lot. And that is not the fact because what we have at Hedera is the Hedera testnet, which is like a network next to the productive network of Hedera that you as a developer can use to deploy smart contracts on it and call them and, and just do your development. And for each account on the testnet, or each account on the testnet receives 10,000 HBAR per day that can be used to, to upload smart contracts, to, to call smart contracts, and so on. We will see later there's even an easier way to do it. But um, what you can do is you can just create an account on, on the testnet. So we have this portal.hedera.com. There you can register for testnet. And then you will receive like your, your private key, your account ID, and so on. That you then just can copy into the Java code or JavaScript code, however, to contact uh, to connect to the network. So um, what we want to do are four steps. First of all, we want to connect to the network or to the ledger. Um, in that case, we will connect ourselves to the testnet. Then we want to upload the compiled contract to the network. Um, out of this compilation, we will create a smart contract. So say that, okay, this binary that we've just uploaded should be a smart contract. And then we will call the smart contract. Um, we will see it in code two. Um, so this is a lot of code. Um, this is the connection. But this is mostly a lot of code because the top lines are all defining the properties for the account and, and for the network. In general, it's only two um, calls that you see in the bottom to create, a, to create a client, because a client need to be connected to one specific network. In this case, we want to connect to the testnet, and a client needs an account that is defined by an ID and then by a key that verifies the account. So once we have it, we can read our compiled file, our compiled smart contract, and create a transaction um, a, a Hedera transaction that contains a bytecode and then just execute this transaction. What we receive is a unique file ID in the response. And now we can use this unique file ID to create a smart contract. So we put in the file ID and in the response we get a contract ID. One point that when I did this the first was quite weird for me is that I need to call the set gas and define an amount of gas. So Michael showed us that gas is what we pay when a transaction for creating a smart contract or executing a smart contract is happening. So why do I now need to define the gas? So the gas that is defined here is not the gas that the creation of the smart contract will cost. It's more like the maximum gas that I will pay for creating the smart contract. Let's assume you did an error. For example, you want to call a function, and the function would end in an endless loop. That could cost a lot of gas. So you can always set like a maximum of gas that you will pay. And if the call um, needs more gas than you have defined, the transaction will always fail with this failed pre-check with the status insufficient gas. So in Java, for example, this will be an exception. Um, While well, gas is kind of uh, yeah, um, a measurement that is quite hard to get, even that we've seen um, on Michael's slide what the different, how much gas the different operation costs. Um, at Hedera, there's um, a calculator online where you can calculate, like, hey, I have a function. I have this function, and I want to put in that many bytes as parameters. How much does it cost? Because calling a smart contract, what you pay is not only the gas, but you pay the bytes too. Like, If you have something that has a huge output, or you, where you put in a huge input, for example, this is what you pay too. And 
as I said at the beginning, this is really why there are H bars, right? So at the end you pay in dollars, uh, in dollars, but maybe the value that you need to pay is so low, um, so it's really much easier to calculate this in H bars than using dollars. And the last step is then calling the contract. Again, we set an amount of gas, and then we just call the method in this point, the creed method. So um, let's have a look. I just created a small Java sample for this. Um, it's a smart contract sample. Um, I wrapped all the functionalities, all the things that we've seen now in, in some helper classes. So I have a client factory, I have a contract factory that creates a contract and so on. And at the end, I just call the contract. Let's just do it. And, and execute this. Hopefully we have internet so that we can connect to testnet. So we definitely have, oh yeah, here we go. So that was slow internet, but we have internet. So what we can do is like we can say, hello DevOx. And now, oh, I need to look there. I don't see this on the monitor. I need to to get the terminal to do the compilation. So let's do the compilation. And let's call our smart contract sample again. Yeah, normally this is way faster. So, but here we see it's it's Hello DevOx, right? Um, so this is working. One last thing, because from my point of view, this is not enough. This is fine, but we are developers. We now work from like an office. We work from home, but we also work from a train, right? And we cannot connect to testnet in this moment. We want to have um, integration tests that may be executed in parallel after each build. We cannot use the testnet in that moment if, if we have that many tests that even the 10,000 H bar are not enough. So we need to find a better solution. And um, again, others have solutions too. I'm showing the solution for Hedera. What Hedera has is the so-called Hedera local node. And this is a Docker-based full Hedera network that you can run on your local machine. So by using Docker, you can set up a Hedera network that you can use for development to deploy smart contracts on, to, to play with them, and so on. Um, everything that you need is hosted on, on GitHub, too. And since for the testnet, you need to create an ID, create a private key, for the testnet, that is already predefined, and you can just see it in the readme from the um, GitHub repo. So the only thing that you need to do is you need to call docker compose up minus d to set up your whole network. And this is super efficient and, and super cool if you really want to create smart contracts, work with them, test them, and so on. And to even make this faster, we're currently in, in contact with Atomic Jar. So those are the people behind test containers, because we want to have this well integrated in test container so that you can really easily create unit tests based on your um, smart contracts. So um, let's have a look at that. Um, again, I need to see the terminal. Uh, no. So let me just start up the network. And now I can do more or less the same that we've did, but instead of um, connecting to, to testnet, I connect to local node config. And what the difference here is, so this just reads two different property files. Um, 
So here you see I have one property file for local node, one for testnet. And in local node, these are just like local IPs and then the key that I copied out of the readme. And if I now start my smart contract example, this is now running against um, the local Docker setup. And this should normally be quite fast. Okay, maybe it was just not there in that moment. But this is working. And what you can do now, um, based on all this, and this is a little bit of future that I show you now, is if you want to interact with such smart contracts, for example, from your, from your Java application, from your enterprise application, and you create such contracts, you want to test them, right? And so this is a kind of um, JUnit plugin that says, okay, I want to have support for smart contracts. So here's the Hello World Soul, which is my smart contract. And I want to test this, so let's query a function on this contract and check that it returns hello world. So now we already know that it needs to return hello DevOps, right? So if I call this one now, what this now really does, it, it compiles the smart contract since it's under source main contract. This is where we, from a Java point of view, have quite good access to, and uploads this contract to a local node that is started by Docker, uh, so the compiled contract, and then we can test it by, for example, executing this method. So if I now go to my um, contract and do like one, two, three, and start the test again, the test will fail because now it would return something else. And, and this is how you, I mean, we are here currently at the start, right? You can, could do a lot of more like providing a Maven plug in that automatically will then um, compile all your things. But here you see it, like, hello, DevOx, hello, DevOx, one, two, three. But this is already a quite good integration on how you can integrate such smart contracts into your yeah, Java developer environment. OK, so um, that's about smart contracts. Um, so we have 45 minutes left. Um, I would say we do like um, another short break, like nine minutes, then we have 40 minutes left for the last pass and some questions. Okay, thank you. Welcome back um, with our third part. So as mentioned, the third part will be about tokens. And yeah, this is my topics. So have fun. <laughs> OK, what is it? All right. So there are two types of tokens. They are fungible and non-fungible tokens, or NFTs. Uh, what's the difference? Well, fungible tokens are interchangeable. So if you have a token, a fungible token, um, of a certain value and you want to trade it against the fungible token with the same value, you can just do that. Um, they are divisible, like you can, you can break them down. Think about Bitcoin, uh, you can have half a Bitcoin, a quarter Bitcoin, etc. And they're uniform. So when you think about fungible tokens, I think the best concept in reality is actually money. Because if you have money, if you have a, a 50 euro um, bill, you can easily exchange it against some, uh, uh, the 50 euro bill from somebody else. Nobody will lose anything about it. And you can break it down. So you have 20 or 10 euro bills and, and you can exchange them as well. You can use two 20 and one 10 euro bill and exchange that against a 50 euro bill and everybody will be treated fairly. Non-fungible tokens on the, other hand, on the other hand are unique. So that means you cannot easily um, interchange them. Each of them is unique and one has a different value to the owner um, than the other one. You cannot divide them. So they are actually reflecting a certain um, thing that cannot be divided. So the best um, concept in the real world, or not the best, but one possible concept in the real world with which you can compare that are trading cards. 
If you have trading cards, um, it doesn't make any sense to take them apart. I mean, if you rip them apart, they are worthless, so you don't do that. Also, you don't really exchange them that easily. You just take, you know, a random card. One person takes a random card, and the other takes a, uh, takes um, the other person takes a random card, and they interchange them. Um, that's probably not going to be a fair deal because those cards have different values. So that's, I would say, these are two good um, explanations or, or images that you can keep in your mind when you think about fungible and non-fungible tokens um, and what the difference are. So let's take a look how they actually look um, in the implementation. And the big surprise is a token is not really much. A token is actually just an address and an ID, and that's it. That's everything that's defined by a token. The magic actually is behind that address. This address points to a smart contract, and this smart contract has to implement a certain um, interface so that it actually becomes um, a token um, that according to that standard. So here we see one of the standards, the ERC721, which is for the uh, NFTs. And we see there are a bunch of methods, balance off, so you can ask uh, what is the balance uh, an owner has, so how much of these, uh, how many of these tokens um, they have. You can check for a token who the owner is, that's the owner of. You can do transfers, safe transfer and the, the a transfer. One is a little dangerous because if the recipient doesn't accept the token, then it will be lost forever. Um, so that's, there are two possible ways how you can call them. And then there are these approve methods, which are a concept that's being used so that you can actually uh, trade NFTs or also fungible tokens on an exchange, for example. You need to approve um, and allow this exchange that um, the exchange can trade uh, tokens on your behalf. And that's what the approval methods are for. So you can approve, um, you can approve a certain um, exchange, for example, to trade a specific NFT. You can also say um, you want to approve a bunch of um, uh, or uh, all your NFTs. Uh, you can get um, the the one who is or who has an approval for a token ID, and you can also um, um, check if a certain um, operator has uh, the approval for all the NFTs for that specific owner. So there are these methods defined, and when you have a smart contract that implements these methods, um, then you basically have a smart uh, um, an NFT according to the standard defined. You don't, need to, you don't really need to implement that yourself. There are uh, implementations available that you can use. They are open source. And also one has to say, this is just the minimum that you need. A typical application like the game that we saw um, has, of course, many, many more um, functions available. But this is the, um, the minimum that's required so that it's considered an NFT and it can be traded on exchanges, for example and then the exchange would use this interface. There are different standards defined in the, uh, from the Ethereum um, community. ERC20 is for fungible tokens, ERC221 is for non-fungible tokens. Then there is this ERC777, um, which was supposed to be an improvement of ERC20, but actually turned out that the implementation is a little tricky and has some security risks, so actually it's recommended to not use that anymore, but just stick to the original ERC-20 um, um, standard. And then there is ERC-1155, which is uh, called the multi-token multi standard. That allows you to, um, or that defines atomic operations so that you can actually trade several tokens uh, in one um, in one transaction, because that way you can ensure that a transaction only takes place if all of the um, transfers are successful. While before that, it was you would have to call several of these transfer methods, and then um, yeah, some of them could fail, and that certainly imposes a problem. And with that, you can um, transfer 
not only several um, tokens of the same type, but actually several tokens of different types uh, in one transaction. All right. Um, now, thinking about a token, what are actually the different stages a token goes through and what are the different things that, that you can do with it? So what you typically do first is you create the token. That basically means you define what, um, what this token is all about, what is its name, for example, and, and things like that. The next, what you do typically, is minting. Um, that's a term that I don't know if it's actually being used anywhere else um, for these kind of activities. Minting means increasing the value of, um, of these tokens. So you can create a token and say, I want to define this token, but initially I just want to have 100 of those fungible tokens, for example. And later you figure out, oh, 100 isn't enough, and you want to increase that amount. And then we speak about you're minting those tokens when you add um, new, uh, uh, new tokens to, um, to the system. Yeah, those tokens that are um, in place, they can be transferred, so you can um, um, assign them to somebody else or, or give them to somebody else. And also, as we've seen, you can, you can approve them so that you can approve an exchange um, that he, uh, the exchange can um, trade tokens on your behalf. Also, this um, helps the exchange to check if you actually have that many um, um, tokens. So you by saying, I want to trade 100 tokens, um, then the exchange would ask for an approval. And while that is happening, you're actually, uh, it's actually being checked that you own these 100 tokens. Um, if at some point the administrator um, figures out, actually, we have too many tokens, uh, you can destroy them. But again, same as with the minting. I forgot to mention that. Not all users can mint, just the administrators. Um, same goes for, the, uh, for burning tokens. That means destroying um, actually the value, making it like say you had 100, you increased that to 1,000, you realized that's too much. I just want to have 200 so you can burn what's, what you don't want anymore. But again, it's just the administrator. And last but not least, last typical stage is uh, you want to delete a token if you want to do that. Um, but actually, tokens are usually not really deleted, but they are just marked as being deleted because they need to stay uh, on the blockchain for, for reference at a later point. So let's see how we can do that with Java. Again, I'm using the uh, Java, uh, the Hedera, um, uh, the Java SDK from Hedera because that makes all of this very convenient and simple to use. So here we can see um, how such a token is created. Um, there is a method to token create transaction, and then we set different values. We set um, a name, like DevOps coin, that's the token I want to create, a symbol, that's um, the abbreviation that you want to use. Then you define um, the admin key, that is, um, let me think about, that's the one, yeah, that's the administrator uh, who can later on mint or burn tokens or also um, delete the token. The supply key, that's the account where new, um, new tokens are being generated. In this case, I'm using, for this exa example, I'm using the same account. So there's one account that can administer stuff, and when you create tokens, they are created uh, here in the, uh, um, in the account that's provided by the supply key. Um, yeah, then you have to define the token type. Here I'm defining fungible token. Um, and if you want to define an NFT, there is a different value for that. Um, and then the, different, uh, the other values are, um, is, it in, is it infinite or finite amount of um, value that you want to have? Um, yeah, I'm just realizing I mix it up. I think the supply key is the one who can burn in mint tokens. The treasury account ID is the one that gets um, the new tokens, and the admin key is actually the one who can change and delete um, the tokens. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm always confusing those three values. Um, yeah, then you set an initial supply and a max supply. So that's the absolute maximum that can be created because we set its finite amount, 
we also need to provide a maximum, but we just create 10 in the beginning and later on we can mint more if we want to. Um, yeah, and then you can request the token ID and you will need that later on. And now you have to show me how to get to the oh, yeah, sure. code. You need to example. Okay, this. Ah, okay, so, yeah. Here we have, again, the beginning is just reading the values, setting up the client. So this is the method that we just took a look at. And um, I'm using the local node config, yeah. So I can, I can, oh no, first I should show that there are no tokens. Um, where is the rest or the? More to the bottom. Yep. Okay, so when we run this, so this is uh, the REST interface with which we can request certain information. So we can see here there are no tokens defined right now. Now I run the uh, create token example that we he had here. takes a while. Your computer is slower than mine. That's funny. Mm. <laughs> so, and here we can see the transaction ID. Um, that's for, for debugging. I can later on check what, if, what the um, output of this transaction ID was, if there were any errors. And then we see the uh, token ID. And when we go to the... I don't see... I have to go to this again down here, right? Uh, if we run this again, we see now we have the token here um, with the information, the, the type, uh, the token ID, and the symbol. And I actually need to copy this. It's just the eight at the end. Whoa. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Now I just need to start this one. No. What do you want to do? Uh, yeah, go kick back again. to the slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So now we have created the tokens. Um, pretty much straight walk forward. It's um, nice about the DERA implementation that everything is provided and you don't even have to deploy a smart contract that allows that. It's just um, there uh, using the token service. And now we want to mint tokens. And now it becomes much easier. I mean, the first... Uh, Transaction was very really difficult because we had to provide so much information. Now it becomes um, easier. So here we want to mint some tokens, um, create new ones, because initially I created just 10, which is not enough. And here with this transaction, I want to create uh, 100 more. So I have to provide the token ID and the amount, and that's it. So it's um, actually straightforward. Okay, and now here we are. Um, and to see what we have right now, I have to, I can get, there's this REST interface. So here we can see now that the total supply is 10 right now. I'll go to the uh, mint example. And here it's exactly what I just showed on the slide. I'll execute Stop. that. The um, token ID is wrong. Oh, oh, okay, right. Yeah, so I have to use the right token ID, of course. Thanks. And when I run that, there's not much to see at this point. I just get the transaction ID at the end in case anything goes wrong. But I can now request the current data. I'll execute this token info again. And now the total supply, as you can see here, is 110. So I just minted more tokens. Um, okay. So um, transfer token, I think I'm not going to show that anymore. It's, it's kind of obvious um, what happens here. Um, so if you want to transfer a token, 
in the Hedera, uh, for when you use the Hedera token service, you need to um, set or, or make sure that the receiver can actually work with these tokens. You cannot just send your tokens to anybody, but you have to allow um, that. Um, so that's the token associate transaction. And then here, the lower one, that's actually the interesting one. That's where I um, transfer tokens. I say I want to transfer um, from the operator ID, that's the, uh, the, um, the account that got all the um, tokens initially. I want to subtract 20 and then um, here to the receiver ID, I want to add 20. And um, when I do that, 20 tokens are transferred from the operator ID to the receiver ID. Okay, so what are the use cases for, for tokens and NFTs in particular? For, for fungible tokens, I actually haven't really found many um, good use cases. It's really more or less a currency or something um, similar, I think. There are, is not much that I can really think of. But for NFTs, there are actually quite a lot of um, useful use cases. I think the first one that everybody counted and see, uh, saw is probably art. You can use it to create NFTs for images. Um, now, certainly when you look at it the first time, you think like, this is just crazy. Why? Um, what's the point of taking an image on the computer, put some NFT to that, and then um, it's different than from just the copy that was there in the first place. Um, in particular, when you look at digital art, it's so easy to, to, do, to create a copy and it's, it has the very same quality as the original. Like, um, um, and that's really a problem for artists in the digital, uh, for, that create digital art. Um, yeah, but the, the NFTs allow you to, spe uh, to specify that a specific piece is the original. You attach it to an NFT and you say, this is the original, everything else is a copy. And even though it is a copy that's 100%, the one is more worth than the other. I'm not really much into the art business. I, don't, I, I still don't understand that, I have to admit, but we can see that this actually works in the real world as well. I mean, if you take a famous picture and you ask a painter to copy that, um, it, I, I think they could create a copy that's so good that nobody or most um, people would not see a difference but still the original is worth a lot more than your copy. And it looks like the same applies for digital art. If the, um, if the artist says, this is the original um, image or art that I created, um, and this NFT proves it, it seems to be worth more and people are willing to, uh, to pay more for that. It's um, interesting. It's not something I really do understand, but I'm not really in the art business. So it's an um, interesting use case, but probably for software developers, I think it's just uh, a different domain. <laughs> um, so, but much more interesting are games and virtual worlds, where this is used a lot. So there, um, in, in games, you often can win certain, you know, armor or, or um, things that you can put on your avatar or whatever. And people are actually going through great length to get these kind of, or to achieve these things. And once they have it, you can, um, you can sell them very often and people are paying real money for things that are actually nothing. I mean, they're just being used in a virtual world or in a game. Um, and with NFTs, you can even increase that because you can um, make sure that a certain armor is unique. There's no other copy possible. You can ensure that as a game developer. So people are willing to pay even more for that. And it's, it, it works, um, as you can see in, um, yeah, in typical games, there's always a big black market usually um, where these things are traded again for money. And with NFTs, you can actually allow or, or participate in that as a game developer because you can uh, create an NFTs for a certain um, um, item in your world. People can trade that on an exchange on the in the blockchain, and um, you get a royalty for that as a game developer. So it's not you can actually make this official and participate and earn money when you do that. So it's an interesting use case for games and virtual worlds, definitely. 
Uh, loyalty programs, it's also something where this is being used. Um, I think just a couple of weeks ago, Starbucks, for an example, announced that they're going to use um, NFTs for their loyalty program. And here it's very difficult. People are often trying to betray companies who give out, you know, bonuses or, um, you know, you, you collect some, uh, some, some stamps and with that you get some free items. And whenever there's some value involved, people are trying to gamble the system and try to um, get the bonus without actually having um, bought so many items from the company, etc. They, they try to get the free coffee without paying 10 coffees up front and stuff like that. And their loyalty program or, or NFTs can help that because you can give out um, a, a, uh, a bonus which is really unique and you can check that and you can actually even check that the person who claims that they're the owner of that NFT uh, actually is the owner. Another interesting use case in my opinion is real estate card investing and, and all of that is actually happening. Like this is not something you know I'm making up or these could be nice ideas. These are things that are being implemented right now or are already available. Um, real estate investing is very nice. I mean, I guess everybody would like to be able to participate in that area, but it's certainly very expensive to buy a flat or a house. You need to have a lot of money. And what people try, um, are exploring here is um, you buy a flat, for example, a very expensive one, and then you break it in smaller pieces. And then you provide NFTs, like a thousand NFTs, which resemble this one flat. And then people can buy that for much less. So they bought, buy a part of that flat, they get um, the money, that the income that flat makes, and they can actually sell it. So there's actually, you could establish a secondary market and you can sell those NFTs which are resembling a flat without actually having to sell the flat itself. So if you just, if you own, I don't know, one or two percent, you can sell this to somebody else who's interested um, without actually selling the flat itself. Now, of course, you can do that without using NFTs, obviously. I mean, the, the um, shares for a company are pretty much the same thing, right? You break the company in smaller pieces and then you shall, uh, sell, you buy and sell shares. Um, but what NFTs provide is, first of all, it's a mechanism that is proven to work and it's much cheaper than dealing with, um, you know, things on paper and manual processes because all of that is automated you can provide the same functionality like you do with shares, just um, automated and much cheaper. Yeah, another use case, and that should be the last one, are uh, education degrees and certificates. I heard it's actually a, a big business to create fake degrees. And when I think about it, it's actually very easy to do that. I mean, I have, for my, uh, for my degree from the university, I just have some paper. And companies usually just want to have a scan of that paper for me to prove that I actually do have a degree. And it's certainly very easy to fake that, you know, scan somebody else's degree um, or, or this uh, certificate, change the name, and you can look, uh, you can pretend that you have your, this certain degree. And with NFTs, again, you can really make those unique. Um, you can make sure that the person who claims they own this degree um, do have that with you know, signatures and all that's involved in there so that you can really be 100% sure that the person who claims to have that degree actually does have that degree. Yeah, and again, universities are looking into this kind of stuff and um, using that. All right, so <clears throat> we are coming to an end. Um, to wrap it up, what is it like to work in this space or to be in this space right now? I think the first thing is it's really, it feels like it's gold rush time with all the pros and cons that have, for sure. There are lots and lots of scams happening. Um, people are trying weird things where you think this can never work, but we'll see. Um, and there are lots of people in there just for the money. And that's something one has to be aware of and one has to be careful of. Um, um, so that you don't fall into the traps um, that are there. Another thing that I would say is that we are just in the very beginning of these things. Like when you look at the usability of all of that, it's not even close to what you would expect 
um, something that the, the majority of people could use. It's really still kind of complicated. You need to set up a wallet, you need to sign everything. It's, the usability is horrible at this point, and that's just one example. Um, and you have to keep that in mind. We're in the very beginning right now. It's, um, we are just exploring the space, building new things. And so I found this um, picture. This is the first, or uh, um, the machine that was considered the first car ever. And of course, nobody would actually buy that and see the usability of, or why would you, um, you know, sell your horse and buy such a thing? Um, but when you look at it, just like, what is it, 150 years later, when you see how cars trans transformed pretty much the world and how everything is done, um, there are lots and lots of potential in that. But still, it's really, we are in the time of the infancy. One always has to remind um, oneself of that. It's an interesting space to work in and to see how these things evolve and the new ideas that are popping up. But we're just at the beginning, in our opinion. And these, that. these are our slides. So we have 11 minutes left <laughs> for questions. Any questions? Okay. Ah, yeah, there's a question. If I would buy a piece of art, yes. like with an NFT. Um, so, as Michael said, I'm not an art too. And, and so, when Michael said it, from my point of view, you mu must divide between art and those monkey images, right? Because a lot of things that are currently happening with NFTs when it goes to art is not art, it's pictures. And it's like assets generated out of several different, like, like this animals that we had. They have a different color, some have one horn, some have, I don't know, like two arms, and it's just generated to be unique, but at the end it's out of a set of assets that put together. And a lot of this um, I pay money for NFT picture things is really based on this, and this is totally weird. And I do not understand how anybody could pay money into that. When it comes to art, I'm not into art, but this is definitely not art, what is going through the press. And I would never buy this one. And regarding art, I do not have the knowledge if it makes sense or not, as, as Mike said. But these are two different words from my point of view. Does this answer you like your question? OK. What, something else maybe to keep in mind when we talk about art is, like in the real world, when you look at real art, like I mean real art, I mean like paintings, it's the very same thing. Like 99% of all the paintings that are created are worthless, um, right? It's just a very small fractions of paintings that are actually increasing in value. You have to know what to look out for to actually invest in art. And yeah, I, I would consider it if I was, would be more into this field and would understand and would have an idea which art actually pays off in the end and is a good investment and which one is not. But that's really totally unrelated to NFTs or um, the technology. It's really, art itself, I think, is really hard. It's like picking stocks, right? There was another question somewhere here. Yeah. You um, explained or, or showed how you can uh, create the tokens. Yeah. But I was wondering, if you have an NFT, how is the, the physical object linked to that token? So um, the question was, we showed, or, or Michael showed, how we can programmatically create an NFT, but in the examples like with the art, so there's a kind of object like an image or something like that that is referenced to the NFT. And your question is, how is this referenced, right? Um, yeah, it depends on the implementation. In um, The Hedera token service allows you to um, specify metadata with every token, and there you can, for example, um, define uh, a URI to a um, to something in the uh, what is the file service interplanetary file system. Yeah. Um, so something that's there in this interplanetary file system, and that 
doesn't change. So it has, if you have uploaded or something committed to that um, file system, it has an ID and that doesn't change. So you can reference that, for example. Um, in other, I mean, when you look at the uh, standard token, there is no information about that. So that's all in the contract itself, how this, how the token, which is just the address and the ID, how that is actually linked to some other data that's implemented in the token. And you have to look at the token code uh, uh, that's linked to the smart contract. And you have to look at the code of the smart contract to see how this token ID is actually linked to, um, um, to other data. I mean, you, you, I assume you can easily do it with a mapping, right? So you, we've seen we have this mapping interface, which is at the end a map. So in your smart contract, you could create a map like, OK, I map, um, I don't know, the token ID to an URL or to a byte array, whatever you want to, and, and store this in the smart, co um, smart contract. Yeah? Uh, I, I understood that originally the idea of blockchain was to be decentralized and not having an authority, which I need to trust. Can, is this, can this idea even be applied to things such as I have in gaming, I have an armor, or yeah. I have a degree. Because it appears to me that I, I would have need to, I need to an authority yeah. because my piece of armor is, is worth nothing without the game, and uh, my degree is worth nothing without the university, which told them the first place. I'm 100% with you. So the question was like, OK, it's all about um, zero trust and and the idea was to to have everything distributed but now we talk about like having armor for a game and without the game or without the publisher of the game even if it's stored in a blockchain the most expensive armor is worth nothing if if you cannot if if the game does goes down for example right so that was your question and i'm 100% with you and i mean I, I assume that is another thing that Michael wanted to show, right? So we're currently having this car. And um, when we talk, for example, about games, maybe, so we already discussed this. So maybe in the future there is, in, in a blockchain or even a specific blockchain, for especially these topics where you can create things that you can even interchange between games or between, like, um, publishers of games, let's assume like you have a, a familiar for a game, like a small animal or something like that, that your character in game A can have, but your character in game B can have too, and you can buy it and then use it in sort of different games. What, or um, you can create custom elements that you can then use in level editors of those games and, and things like that, but we're by far not at that point at all. Yeah. So this is this is regarding games. What I'm thinking about this regarding certificates and and what was it like? Um, what have you shown? Like education degrees or things like that. So maybe there is then uh, a blockchain that is uh, provided by I don't know. Um, maybe several universities or maybe. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, um, yeah. You, you have to differentiate here between the infrastructure and actually uh, the authority that is uh, creating or, or um, signing the, uh, the degree. I mean, the, the blockchain is really about the infrastructure which needs to be decentralized because you don't want to trust a single, um, a single entity. I mean, even companies that claim that they don't do evil do evil things. So, um, you know, that's what the idea is about. You still need somebody to say when, when it's about a uh, university degree, univers your university has to say, yeah, um, Hendrik has a degree, and here is my signature to make, uh, to, uh, I'm signing that, and <clears throat> I'm, clay or I'm making sure that everybody understands that Hendrik has this degree. Hendrik can go now to a company and say, here, you see, um, here's the information. It's signed by the university, and then this company can check, OK, this signature is really from that university, so therefore this degree has to be uh, correct and wasn't really corrupted or, or just copied from somewhere. So uh, there are two things here that one has to differentiate. The infrastructure needs to be decentralized, but um, for, for uh, creating degrees or, or also if you want to have your, your personal ID, uh, on the blockchain, 
then some authority has to sign that. That, and, that doesn't and, change. Yeah, and we need a kind of standard or at least a definition how it looks like so that different authorities can use it, right? Because otherwise it don't make much sense, yeah. But again, we are not there. So those are ideas. And people are currently working on it, but it's not that it's widely used. Okay, so two minutes left. A short question maybe, yeah? Ah, okay, there, there are no race conditions because how this works is, yeah, I forgot to mention it actually, sorry about that. So um, we, remember we have this consensus uh, algorithm. So you have all these transactions coming in and then all the nodes need to agree on a certain order of these transactions. And when they have that, they execute them one by one. So you don't execute two transactions at the same time. Once you have this specific order of transactions, you just taking the first one, executing it, and once it's done, you take the next one and execute that on all those nodes. Yeah. No, no, no. All the nodes execute that um, transaction by themselves. Yeah, but before so they need to communicate to oh yeah, define so an order. They need to define the order, but once they have that order, um, they get the, uh, the, the address of the smart contract that should be called, plus the parameters, all of that is part of the transaction. And then they run this, um, um, this virtual machine, machine by themselves. They find out what the result is, they store that in the local state, and they don't need to communicate with other nodes while they're doing that. It's really just about con uh, creating consensus about the, the order of those transactions. Once you have that, you're good. Okay, I, I think time is up, but okay. we're here until, um, uh, well, Wednesday. Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday. So yeah. if you have any questions, you can certainly stop and ask us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>